Ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Father, first of all, I must confess I'm going to try and compress a 75 minute talk into about 45 to 50 minutes. So it's a quite a difficult task. And one of the difficulties I have is there's a lot of information I have to present which are referenced, but it would break too much of the, the talk flow to continually press the button and have lots of PowerPoint presentations and being born about 1960, I'm not that techno, so I tend to think things a little bit wrong. But please bear with me as we go through this very, very important topic, which is a contraception and abortion, fruits of the same tree. So ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Father, we are now living in the greatest genocide in human history, where the number of deaths are absolutely staggering. Where between 1.5 and 2 billion babies have perished at least since 1967, more than one quarter of the world's total population. Abortion, of course, the modern slaughter of the innocents. Where the most dangerous place in the world is a mother's womb. 44 million every year. More than 120,000 per day. More than one per second. And by the end of this talk, more than 3,750 babies would have perished from abortion. The numbers are, are mind-numbing, aren't they? And we can't even count the unknown lost babies from the morning after pill. The abortifacient effects of contraceptives like the pill and IUD, and of course the abortion drug IU486, where statistics are not kept. Ladies and gentlemen, what is the cause of this terrible tragedy? What lies behind this unimaginable holocaust? Well, it might surprise you to know that I think one of the major causes is in fact contraception. The contraceptive mentality, and particularly the oral contraceptive pill. I believe this has played a huge part in the abortion genocide, because contraception leads to unplanned babies. And unfortunately, unplanned babies leads to abortion. This afternoon we shall see that contraception and abortion are in fact really fruits of the same tree. Secondly, we shall see how contraception not only lead to abortion, but also, in fact, to the culture of death. And finally, if we have time, we shall discuss what we can do about these terrible evils that are in our society, what we can do about this terrible mess we're in. Now, it was Blessed John Paul II who stated in Evangelium Vitae, contraception and abortion are very closely connected as fruits of the same tree. Let's ask ourselves, how does contraception lead to abortion? How are they fruits of the same tree? After all, you will know it's very much commonly claimed they're very opposite, that by increasing contraception, we can in fact decrease the number of abortions. And last year, Mia Friedman wrote in her internet site, I believe, well she has an internet site, but she actually wrote, that why don't we increase the amount of contraception so that we can decrease the number of abortions? It's a very common mentality. Preventing unwanted pregnancies by preventing conception prevents abortion. That's how the argument goes. And abortion is killing a baby. Far worse than contraception, which is merely preventing a baby from being conceived. But in a sense, contraception is actually worse than abortion. Why? Why? Because, in fact, a child never conceived will never, ever live. The child will never even exist. At least an aborted child, terrible as sin that may be, will at least live forever in the next world. Because we know the child's soul is immortal. And therefore, the Roman Catechism on this point said something very interesting. This is a catechism that was the reference point last, largely for the last, most of last century. 
Whoever in abortion, in, in marriage, whoever in marriage artificially prevents conception or procures an abortion commits a most serious sin, the sin of premeditated murder. This is extremely strong language. Okay, it's true that in contraception there is no intention to kill, while abortion both intends and actually commits the killing of the child. But while abortion, the abortion mentality says, I don't want a child, I'm preventing a child from being born, the contraceptive mentality says, I don't want a child, I'm preventing a child from being conceived. Clearly, both abortion and contraception, contraception are both anti-life. Fruits of the same anti-life tree. And ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Father, this is very clear when contraception fails, when there is an unintended pregnancy. In the United States, for example, according for, to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, abortions usually result from unintended pregnancies, which often occur despite the use of contraceptives. More than 54% of women having abortions used a contraceptive method during the month they became pregnant, more than half. Australian studies also show that between one half and two thirds of women having abortions were actually contracepting at the time they fell pregnant. So, of the women presenting for abortion, at least half are for con contraceptive failure. More than half abortions are from contraceptive failure. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you want to ask yourselves, what sort of woman actually presents, typically has an abortion? According to the Australian editor Healy, in Abortion Issues, in the Fast Facts section, he says this, young women in their 20s, single, childless, well-educated and employed. That's the typical profile. In the United States, 85%, 85% of all abortions occur to single women. 85%. About three quarters of abortions in that country are to those younger than 29. Under 29. And Australia, of course, we don't doubt, is very similar. Obviously, these women weren't ready to have children. We could ask ourselves, were they really ready to engage in intimate activity? Well, remember a young teenage patient of mine who came in to see me. She was a teenager at the time and she was pregnant. And she said, I am too young for this. I couldn't talk her out of having an abortion. I don't know why, but she continued to see me as a doctor after the abortion. And she went and, as commonly happens, lived together with a young man and she wasn't using any method of contraception for a number of years. And pitifully she would come to me a number of times and say, I don't know whether that would be the only child I will ever have. Very, very sad. I'll tell you more about her story later on in the talk at the end. Unfortunately, there is also an increasing number of another group of women Older women, working mothers, who choose to focus on their career, current children and financial stability than having another baby. This is very sad, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen, because they obviously know they're killing a baby because they've had children already. Now, I wanted to move on and talk about the reasons that women give for abortion. There are three big reasons women give for abortion. Firstly, 
half sane. They do not want to be a single parent or having problems with their husband or partner. Relationship problems, about half. About three quarters say they cannot afford a child. Lack of money. Thirdly, three quarters say that having another baby would interfere with work, school, or other responsibilities. Now looks at the re- let's look at the reasons for contracepting, apart from the obvious, to, to stop having a baby. But why are they doing this? Nearly half said they did not have a stable partner. Many did not want to be a single mother. Does that sound familiar? Almost two-thirds say they could not afford to take care of a baby. That is lack of money. Thirdly, almost half said that having a baby would make it difficult to keep their jobs or to get new ones. And about 43% said it would be make it hard to stay at school. There were other reasons given, but can you see the very obvious? The same selfish reasons justifying abortion are the same selfish reasons given for contracepting. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is why it's so easy to commit an abortion after contraception fails. Because the mentality involved in contracepting, those reasons that are given, carry over into the very same reasons women give for having an abortion. This is why contraceptive failure makes up more than 50% of abortion presentations. This is why providing more contraception actually leads to more contraceptive failure and more abortions. As Blessed John Paul II said in Evangelium Vitae very, very wisely, though many contracept to stop temptation to abortion, the anti-life values in the contraceptive mentality in fact strengthen the temptation to abortion when an unwanted life is conceived. I will remember a 38-year-old Indonesian woman just a few weeks ago, Catholic mother of three, who conceived on the injectable contraceptive wanting to have an abortion. She cried when I said, you're not allowed to take, you can't take communion if you have an abortion. Still haven't worked out whether she kept the child or not. And by the way, Catholics, the statistics say, are just as likely to have an abortion as anybody else. It doesn't seem to matter, the religion. Now I want to look at contraceptive statistics. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics in 1995, an amazing two-thirds of women all Australian women between 18 and 49 use some method of contraception. And what do you think was the most popular? The oral contraceptive pill at 40%. In 1995, there was an incredible 1.1 million women on the oral contraceptive pill in Australia. 1.1 million. Now, according to Dr. Edith Weisberg of the New South Wales Family Planning Association, former New South Wales Family Planning Association director, the pill has an annual practical failure rate of 6% across the board, single and married. With a failure rate of 6% per year, that means six out of every 100 women on the pill fall pregnant every year. Six out of 100. For single women, the failure rate is actually a lot higher. It's something in the order of 10 to 12 percent, 10, 11, 12 percent. That means that amount of women, single women, will fall pregnant every year on the pill. If you do the maths, that means in 1995, 66,000 Australian women fell pregnant on the pill with a temptation to abortion. 66,000. Roughly a half a million women were using the condom, and that's got a failure rate of 15% per year. That means 72,000 unintended pregnancies 
happen to those who are using condoms as a method of contraception. So you add that up, that's 138,000 women faced with the abortion dilemma in 1995 to those methods of contraception alone, 138,000. And if you work out the maths, about 30 to 40 percent, roughly that amount, will go on to have an abortion. Now not all women, of course, who fall pregnant have an abortion, and I do have a slide which actually shows the increase of ex-nuptial births. And actually I might refer to it because it's very, very interesting. Um, beware. Bear with me as we get to that slide. You see the slide? The percentages of birth out, birth out of wedlock, you can follow the line, 1910, 1930, 1950, what do you think is happening here? It's starting to take off, isn't it? What do you think happened at this event of time? The introduction of the oral contraceptive pill. 35% of children now are born out of wedlock. 35%. Beautifully coinciding with the introduction of the oral contraceptive pill. So not all women who fall pregnant on the pill go on to have an abortion or other methods of contraception, but a lot of them do. And there you have the other result, ex-nuptial births. In just six years, almost a third of women, of all women on the pill, fall pregnant or face the temptation of abortion. According to Dr. Edith Whiteberg, in about 10 years, half the women taking the pill will fall pregnant. Half for the temptation to abortion. And of course, if you're single, the rates are much higher. That's why you can see that 85% of women presenting for abortion are actually single women. Now I want to turn our attention to abortion statistics. It's commonly touted a figure of about 80,000 abortions per year in Australia. Have you heard that figure, about 80,000? It's wrong. It's wrong. The figure is actually much higher. The Australian Bureau of Statistics reported in the financial year June 1996, 95,200 abortions. That's a real statistic. It's all the hospital and Medicare reported, recorded abortions. So there probably is an underestimate as well. That's roughly one in abortion per three live births. It's a rough figure. So if you use that statistic, one to three live births, there are roughly 300 and 1,617 live births in 2011. If you do the maths, that means it's 111,500 abortions in 2011, following the exact same percentage. And we can actually estimate that in Australia, since the, the 60s, Australia's lost perhaps up to 4 million children to abortion, just Australia alone. That's nearly 25% of the, Australia's total population, of 23 million. A further statistic is if these were 70% first-time abortions, because some women obviously have a number of abortions, then something like 2.8 million women have already had an abortion today. 2.8 million, it's almost one in four Australian women. And if you think I'm exaggerating, Healy reports in his abortion issues that one in three Australian women will have an abortion. One in three women will have an abortion, and the United States is no, is no different, and I have references for that afterwards, if you want. It cannot be seriously doubted that legalising abortion has opened the floodgates to the abortion genocide. If single women were not intimate, we could reduce abortion perhaps by an incredible 85%, 95,000 in Australia. Imagine if women did not contracept and abstained instead. It would more than halve the abortion rate. For as the Australian Bureau of Statistics says, termination of pregnancy 
is generally responds to an unintended pregnancy resulting from contraceptive failure or unplanned sexual activity. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to move on to the second part of our talk. How does contraception lead to other aspects or contribute to the other aspects of the culture of death? How does a contraceptive lead to expressions like suicide, euthanasia, IVF, divorce, coercive family planning programs? I think we need to look at this from a, a historical perspective. To begin with, contraception was justified, particularly with Catholics, on the basis of conscience. Have you heard that word? Conscience? When the pill was introduced by one Dr. John Rock, daily, mass-going Catholic in the late 1950s in the United States, he argued against the teaching of the Church, which banned artificial forms of birth control. Rock believed you could follow your own conscience. Conscience would be the catch cry for those years later who reject the Church's teaching contained in Humanae Vitae. And unfortunately, I think this is where one of the root problems of our Catholic world stem from, even church hierarchies bought in to this conscience and basically said Catholic women could still contracept and go to communion and receive the sacraments based on their conscience. Based on their conscience. I think this is one of the reasons why the church around the West is so weak today. We haven't got time to go into those stories, but history, the history is there of what happened after Humana Vitae. Now, conscience is not desire, fancy, whim, or social fashion, whatever I like. Conscience is my mind judging whether an action is actually right or wrong but according to an objective moral law, an absolute moral standard, a law of right or wrong which is actually outside of ourselves and we didn't make up ourselves. And what the church does, it, the church infallibly guards and teaches the moral law without error so that we might have a sure guide to doing the right thing in our lives. Now let's apply conscience to contraception. The moral law states that it is wrong to contracept. An informed conscience takes on board that it's wrong to contracept, the contraception is wrong. Now a good conscience weighs up whether particular actions, like taking the pill, or the IUD, using IUD, or using condom, with the intention of contracepting, is in fact contracepting. If these actions are contracepting, conscience judges rightly if it says this is wrong. Conscience doesn't actually judge that contraception is okay, and therefore taking the pill or the using ID or condom is okay. This is actually what we call a false or erroneous conscience. Conscience does not make up the moral law. Conscience does not make up the standards of right and wrong. I can no more judge that contracepting is okay more than I can judge murder is okay. But for Dr. John Rock, somehow or other, conscience meant that each individual could decide for him or herself whether contraception is right or wrong. It was very similar to one Margaret Sanger. You might ask, who is Margaret Sanger? Well, Margaret Sanger was a lapsed Catholic, and she was founder of Planned Parenthood, the, last, the largest abortion provider in its member organisations throughout the world. And she was an apostle, a great apostle of contraception and birth control. And it was she who found the funding for Dr. Johns Rock's research on the oral contraceptive pill enabling it to be released to the general public. She said, men and women of America, 
are demanding they allowed to they be allowed to mold their lives not at the arbitrary command of church or state, but as their conscience and judgment may dictate. See, not only did the church in those days condemn contraception, but also the state. There were anti-contraceptive laws at one stage. You know that mentality is very, very catchy, isn't it? it? Sounds good, doesn't it? Decide for yourself what is right or wrong. Sounds like the temptation in the Garden of Eden, doesn't it? Decide for yourself whether contraception or abortion is right or wrong. Throw off authority. Doesn't it just appeal to our pride? No one can tell me what to do. I'll decide myself. You know, it's very seductive, that mentality. But what do we call this mentality, ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Father? Moral relativism. Isn't it true? Moral relativism. Moral relativism is the idea that there, is, there are no absolute standards of right or wrong, no absolute moral, moral law that everyone has to follow. You decide what's right and true for you, and I'll decide what's right and true for me. And what does it mean when we all follow this moral relativism? What is this a recipe for? A recipe for anarchy. It's a recipe for Kermit Gosnell's House of Horrors. You know, you've heard of Kermit Gosnell? And the infanticide? Mm. Removing, decapitating infants' heads that were born after botched abortions? Recently convicted of first degree murder, awaiting sentence. Or as Cardinal Ratzinger said, this is a recipe for the dictatorship of relativism. We are moving toward a dictatorship of relativism, relativism which does not recognise anything as for certain and which has as its highest goals one's own ego, one's own desires. In other words, life is about me, me, me. What I want, what I wish, what I desire. And I don't really care what you think so long as I get my way. And at the root of this particular sin, Sanger wrote, she didn't write saying that, but this is what she wrote, our objective is unlimited sexual gratification without the burden of unwanted children. Lust. Good old lust. Lust is at the root of the sexual revolution which sought contraception as the way to indulge in this particular activity, lust. Further, she said this, very, very interesting. Women must have the right to, quote, to live, to love, to be lazy, to be an unmarried mother, to create, to destroy. To destroy. The most merciful thing that a family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. This woman was dangerous. Her ideas have spread throughout the whole world, causing chaos. Now, of course, in response to the crisis that the release of the oral contraceptive and the whole push for contraception had in the world, Pope Paul VI in 1968 had to issue a reply. And in Humanae Vitae, written in 1968, he repeated the church's traditional ban on artificial forms of birth control. But ladies and gentlemen, would you believe that the papal spokesman releasing this document undermined the very document itself on the same day when he spoke about it because he said, this is not necessarily infallible teaching. Do you know what he was saying by that? Well, you could still God recept, you know. It could be still all right. See, he was a member of the majority report on the birth, so-called birth control commission. And you know, the majority report on the birth control Mission actually recommended to the Holy Father 
allow contraception. Allow contraception. The majority report said you could contracept if your intention was good for the sake of a proportionate or greater good or to avoid bad consequences, it could be justified. Too many children could weaken my love for my spouse so I can contracept to strengthen my marital love. Oh yeah, I want more children but I can't afford it right now. So I can contracept till I can work till I have enough money. Ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Father, what do we call this principle? The ends justify the means. With logic like that, with argument like that, you can actually justify anything. I can steal if I need money. I can lie to get out of trouble. And of course, I can have an abortion if I cannot afford the baby. This is a very, very interesting sideline, broadly related to this. In 1968, the Harvard Ethics Committee released a paper arguing to redefine death. And on that committee were two transplant surgeons. And you know why they wanted to redefine death? Because so you could actually take the organs from our so-called brain-dead person who was actually still alive and use those organs with somebody else and not call it murder. Very, very interesting. 1968, that same day actually in Sydney, there's a World Medical Association meeting and they also said the same thing. They proposed the same changes for the determination of death as the Harvard paper to in include irreversible coma. The ends justify the means. Now the majority report argued a couple could be in general open to life, but not every individual act has to be open to life. Okay, you get the general flavour, you know, my intention is generally to open, but you know, now and then I won't be open to life. Well, what's this like? It's like saying, I can be in general faithful to my beloved spouse, but not every act of marital intercourse has to be with her. It's a bit faulty, isn't it? I can be in general open to life, but not every single child I conceive has to be born. It's abortion. This is faulty logic, ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Father. So, of course, Pope Paul VI had to reaffirm the Church's traditional teaching that all artificial means of birth control, all of them, are wrong. In fact, he couldn't even he can't change the constant he couldn't change the constant teaching of the Church any more than he could change the laws of gravity. Why? Because this teaching is natural law. It's the way God made it. Pope Paul VI said that in Hermana Vitae, the marital act has two inseparable meanings, the unitive and the procreative. The unitive, bringing the spouses together, and the procreative, the potential to have children. And the marital act is ordered by its very nature to these same things simultaneously. Even if the couple are sterile, each and every marital act must remain open to the transmission of life. Why is contraception wrong? Why does the church say that contraception is wrong? It's not just a positive law. Simply say it's wrong, therefore it's wrong. It's because contraception tries to sterilize the marital act. And the marital act is inherently procreative in potential. It's contradictory language, as Pope John Paul II would later say. A contradiction in language. Now, to use an example, do you think a man would marry a woman who just before they got married would have a hysterectomy? Do you think a man would marry a woman like that? Do you think a woman, just before she marries a fiancé, he goes on to have a vasectomy? Do you think she would marry a woman like that? Well, if you can get that, then you know 
contraception is against the natural law. It's illogical. Because in both cases, they are destroying the life-giving potential of the marital act. The only difference with the pill is it's a temporary form of rendering that life-giving potential sterile. Taking the pill is as illogical as giving only half of the ring at the wedding. You're not giving yourself fully for the full potential to give life. Using a condom is as illogical as giving the wedding ring and then taking it straight back after the wedding. You're giving and then you're taking. You're not giving yourself totally and completely to your spouse. Contraception is wrong because you're not giving yourself fully to your spouse. And this is the inherent unitive meaning of the marital act, which as he says at the same time, a procreative act. Just as I'm sure any married woman here would not want, would not have wanted half her husband, a part-time husband. Yeah, you can have me for six days a week. The other day I'll be off at the pub with my mates all day long. Okay? A woman wants the whole of her husband. Contraception is wrong, not just because the church says it so, but because it's unnatural, it breaks the natural law. And this law is written on our hearts. If you can understand those examples I've given, then you know Contraception doesn't need any fancy argument. It's written on our hearts. Now, very quickly, what are the consequences of abortion, of contraception? Firstly, divorce. If you do not give yourself fully to your spouse in the marital act, what can happen over time? Slowly but surely, you give less and less and less of yourself until you eventually give nothing. What happens after that? Divorce. Marriage requires 100% unconditional love. But when you're contracepting, you're not giving that 100% unconditional love. You're holding something back for yourself. It's conditional that you don't fall pregnant, that we make sure we don't fall pregnant. And this means over time, the marriage can become more self-seeking. It can be more self-seeking love, which can lead to more using somebody, for selfish sexual gratification. And again, the end result can be divorce. This is borne out by statistics. Before contraception was introduced, what do you think the divorce rate was in Australia? 9% of the marriage rate. Now what's the divorce rate, the percentage of the marriage rate after contraception, years later, decades later? 40%. Any idea the divorce rate of those who practice natural family planning, they give themselves totally to their spouse in the marital act each time? 2%? 0.2%, 2 per thousand, according to a life site news report. Marital infidelity and the lowering of moral standards, especially among the young. Adultery, reportedly at 18 to 20% of marriages. Teen sexual experience. Children born out of wedlock, our slide up here. De facto relationships. Most couples who marry now can have it first. And of course, abortions we've mentioned. You know, just with cohabitating couples, in the United States alone, before the advent of the pill, there was a certain co cohabitating rate. But after the pill was introduced, from 1960 to 98, do you know how much that rate went up, the cohabitating rate? tenfold. That's a, a thousand percent. Contraceptive sex is also sterile sex. It's obviously paved the way for homosexual acts, which are also sterile. As Mary Eberstadt's Hoover Institute Research Fellow and author reflected, once heterosexuals start claiming the right to act as homosexuals, contraceptive sex, it would not be long before homosexuals start claiming the rights of heterosexuals. What do you call that? Gay marriage. Men may lose respect for women and reduce her to being a mere instrument for the satisfaction of his own desires. Just one very brief example is the way the media portrays women today as seductive sex objects. 
creating a fantasy for the attractive woman for men. Pornography, prostitution, immodest fashions, the media, degrading sexual practices that women are often forced to undergo. The tyrant state with coercive birth control laws. China with its brutal one-child policy. Recently had the example of that forced late-term abortion of Fen Janmai, which caused such an internet storm that China reversed its policy to end forced late-term abortions, forced abortions, particularly late-term abortions. To Australia's great shame, Victoria now has abortion up to the ninth month of pregnancy, making Victoria's abortion laws among the most permissive in the whole world. Late-term abortions as a result in the Royal Women's Hospital have increased 600%, sixfold, since 2008. Unbelievably, there is no right of conscientious objection for doctors. A doctor with an objection to abortion has to refer a patient who wants an abortion to someone who doesn't have an objection. Last Saturday, I spoke with Dr. Mark Hobart, who was spoken to by the medical board for doing exactly that, refusing to refer a woman for a sex-selective abortion, a hero for pro-life cause. A doctor or nurse has to assist in an emergency abortion. There's no ifs or buts. Has to assist in performing an emergency abortion if the pregnant woman's life is in danger. This is the law. Freedom of conscience is now threatened, as well as freedom of speech, threatened by the state. In Australia. In Australia. A doctor was reprimanded by the medical board for debating over the internet that he believed abortion was wrong. Now, if a doctor could be reprimanded by the medical board, it won't be too long before the state will reprimand the Catholic Church for a stand against abortion. This is why we have to stand up now, because it may be too late and be sent off to jail for being Catholic. I'm not exaggerating. Tasmanian Parliament is currently debating an exclusion zone for protesters near abortion clinics with severe financial sanctions if they're broken. Now, this is so hypocritical. They're not going to prosecute the Greenpeace protesters for boarding coal vessels, are they? They've got conscience, we don't. What about the Vietnam War process? They're allowed to have conscience, but we're not allowed to have it. It's terribly hypocritical. Playing God, life and death. Margaret Sanger said, each woman is absolute mistress of her own body, meaning absolute personal autonomy. It's my body, I'll do what I like with it. And domination of our sexual powers leads to domination over our bodies. Domination over our bodies leads to domination over the fruit of our bodies, the unborn child who's in the mother's womb. Through moral relativism, the unborn child is no longer seen as a human person, as a gift, but a bit of tissue, a commodity, to be created, used, manipulated, abused, and discarded at will, a mere extension of my body. The inedible human rights of the unborn child are simply dismissed as the Sanger mentality takes over, the right to destroy life, the right to create life. And so today we have rationalised abortion, multifetal pregnancy re reduction, IVF, surrogacy, embryonic stem cells research, and even the sickening use of embryos for medical research and commercial enterprises like cosmetics. In such a culture as this, is it surprising that it's also becoming a culture of murder and terrorism? Now, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the final part of my talk, what can we do about this mess? But I've been given the wind-up signal. I'm sure you know what to do. Firstly, we have to get on our knees and pray, and pray hard. We need to get on our knees and pray, and we need to do penance. We need to get close to our Lord and seek the wisdom to know what to do in these difficult times. And then we need to support the pro-life movement if we can't help directly ourselves. There will be an appeal for financial help later on. How can we build a new culture of death, defeat the culture of, build a new culture of life and defeat the culture of death? 
while we're living in this new spiritual dark ages, we must live the gospel, the gospel, the light of Christ. We must spread the gospel like the Paschal candle light, like Pentecost, which we're now in. Study, read the signs of the times, study the theology of the body, recognize the threats that we're in, and do something about it. And above all, live out the gospel of love, the gospel of life and love. Love one another as I have loved you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Oh. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, you wondering about that story I had in general practice? Let's forget this, we're not trying to wind up. Yes, that young lady actually fell pregnant twice and had two beautiful children, and she was very, very happy. And then she fell pregnant a third time, a terrible morning sickness, and very, very stressed from looking after two very, very young children who were born very quickly in a row. And she said, I don't know whether I can have this baby. I don't know whether I can cope. She was thinking again of having another abortion. And I tried to talk to her about it and I said, you know how to feel, you know, when you had this... Yeah, but uh, I don't know if I can cope. And I thought I didn't convince her. I thought that the cause was lost because she'd already had one. Because many abortions are repeat abortions. But she did come back to me a few weeks later and said, I've decided to keep the child. So, a good story to end the note. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah.